just briefly before I go into the trends, I'd like to introduce my company. <clears throat> Excuse me. So very basically, uh, and personally, um, I've been based in Asia for, this is going into my 21st year, which gives you an idea of just how old I am. And, uh, and basically, we work across three areas, which is strategic research, trend forecasting, and innovation consultancy. Um, I have a research team who are based throughout Asia, uh, here in Korea, in Japan, in China, and also in Southeast Asia. And basically what we do is we really try to understand changing consumer behavior and, uh, and looking at that, um, try and innovate or uh, create products that reflect those changing needs. Um, I originally lived in uh, Hong Kong, then I moved to China and then Japan, and now I'm based between Singapore and Malaysia. So I moved from Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia, but I work globally. So everything I do is through a global lens, but very particularly focused on Asian consumers. Aside from uh, the innovation consultancy and the strategic research, which is for multinationals as well as um, you know, more kind of medium-sized beauty personal care brands, we also have a trends platform where we put reports and intelligence onto the service every single day. And, uh, and these go across everything from new product launches to analysis on big uh, meta, or we call them meta, but... Um, major or mega consumer trends. So the reason that we're very interested in this uh, ecosystem of trends where we have uh, a mega or a meta trend followed by a more micro trend is that particularly in beauty, uh, there is no such thing as a, a product that launches really just uh, because it looks good. Usually there are cultural drivers that um, provide the, the, the point of reference why that product might resonate with consumers. So today I'm uh, speaking a little bit um, about, well, I'm speaking about fragrance and I've picked three trends that we're really looking at right now in fragrance. Uh, these trends are modesty, scent curation, and modern indigenous. And they really go across um, the spectrum in terms of modesty is really focused on um, the idea about how marketing campaigns are changing. Because within fragrance, it obviously is more about the marketing and how a fragrance, how the context of the fragrance is before it's launched. Scent curation looks more about technology and the future of scents. And the last one is modern indigenous, which is um, how scents are themselves are changing and adapting to the APAC region, which could be subtitled for Asians by Asians. So the first trend uh, really looks at the contextual reasons on how fragrance is changing in this part of the world. So traditionally, fragrance advertising has been built on sex and seduction, um, you know, marketing for perfumes and colognes, particularly in Europe and the US, uses, you know, semi-naked people to advertise brands. And this is all about the idea that a scent could ignite, you know, sexual attraction. But what happens to advertising and product development when studies demonstrate that people the world over are no longer having as much sex as they once did? Um, or modesty trends, and I'll go into what modesty means a bit later. Um, modesty trends in the fashion world, and, you know, which are influenced by what we call faith-compliant apparel, shift the image of what sexy looks like. So a quick Google search, this should wake you up, it is the morning, so hopefully uh, <laughs> some of these images. Um, a quick Google search of, you know, sex plus perfume pulls up hundreds of fragrances with the word sex in them. For example, you know, sex in the city branded perfume through to brands known as sexual or sex appeal for men, um, as well as obviously brands that are linked to sexiness. So imagery of half-dressed men and women um, in the act of sex, or even about to have sex, aka the seduction phase, will also appear if you do these searches. And as it should if you were doing this such specific search criteria. Yet the most peculiar aspect 
I feel now to this visual search is how campaign imagery actually feels quite dated and almost eerily similar. Many images have a look and a feel from a similar era, the 90s to be precise. The late, the late 90s appeared to be a world where hedonism was clearly part of the cultural zeitgeist. And actually, it was also a period of time when people were actually having more sex on average than they do today. So according to a recent study, um, and you can ask me about this study after, um, it came out in March, American adults are having sex nine times fewer than they did in 2000, uh, sorry, in, in 2014, Americans are having sex nine times fewer than they did in the 90s. And there was a great article in the New York Times titled, It's Not Just You, Americans Are Having Less Sex. And it kind of analyzed this report and summarized that a number of factors have led to a decline in sexual frequency. Americans, as well as everyone around the world, in fact, now have far more options when it comes to filling their leisure time. This includes spending time on social media, such as Facebook, playing video games, and binge-watching content on Netflix. But what's really fascinating from a campaign and product development perspective is how longer working days and pornography was actually ruled out as a cause for a drop in global sexual behavior. In fact, these drivers are often tied to higher sexual activity, which leads to the question, bringing it back to probably why we're in the room, how do brands built on sexual imagery remain relevant to the fragrance world and beyond in the 2020s, which for many of us is our product development cycle. In 2017, we're looking into the 2020s. A great example of that would have been Unilever's Axe, which is also known as Lynx in some markets. Um, it was a brand that actually has done an amazing job very, very recently in repositioning itself from an overtly sexual, um, as well as, you know, some people used to say it was somewhat demeaning to women, um, brand. So what is really cool about its current positioning is that it attempts to shift its former image from seducing girls to a dialogue around male empowerment. And the tagline for, the, um, for its new campaign is, um, is it okay? And then basically it's like a search for Google and men can say, is it okay to read books? Is it okay to, you know, feel bad about certain things? Sort of showing that there is more to men than this whole idea about, you know, just chasing women. So meanwhile, within this idea about modesty, um, is that the market for what's known as modest fashion, and this is actually really quite key as well because fashion trends really influence fragrance trends, um, is projected to grow to 484 billion by 2019. And this demand is fueled mainly by young women who seek out fashion that covers them. And so while we think about that, you know, we've all learned about halal, beauty, and, and so on. But it's not just um, Muslims, it's actually Christians, it's Jews. And generally speaking, it's just women the world over who feel that they need to cover up a bit more to be taken seriously. And, uh, and so, you know, basically what we're seeing is it could be in the ebb and flow of fashion trends. But the reality is, is that people in countries such as Japan and Korea particularly, and I've done work for a multinational on this subject related to fragrance, is that they're marrying later, they're having children later in life, if at all, and these major shifts in behavior and attitudes to what's considered attractive and sexy are rapidly changing in this country. Um, with that, you also see a decline in alcohol consumption, and, um, and so think about it. You know, traditionally, this idea is that you go out drinking, get a bit drunk, start chatting up the opposite sex, um, might lead to something else later. But if people aren't drinking, if they're not going to bars, and they're not having as much sex as previous generations, how do fragrances which contain notes such as musk or this, you know, the idea of sex, how do, the, you know, how do they appear in this modern day? 
And this idea is that the fact that many of them are starting to feel a bit dated and off message and to some cultures even offensive. So this idea that if you're in Indonesia or India, which is the largest um, halal market in the world, if you're trying to sell your, you know, geo based on a girl walking out of the sea um, half dressed, it really isn't going to resonate in the future. So this leads nicely to my next trend, which is called scent curation. So rather than seeing the growth of modesty related fashion and people having less sex as business problems, the opportunity to innovate fragrances and for how people lead their lives is actually far more exciting. Scents that are inspired and are triggered by, having, uh, by emoticons from smartphones feel more relevant to a millennial than a campaign involving you know, a half-dressed girl. So for me, the idea that a range of fragrances inspired by and that could help people play their video games, because that requires concentration, is going to be way more relevant to Generation Z than the current set of fragrances that are on the market or lucky fragrances that guys can wear when they're watching their favorite football team. These are far more in tune with today's male consumer in Asia than, you know, some of those brands such as Axe in its previous incarnation ever was in APAC. Scents that also tying to the growing concerns around ethical issues, which are growing in the region. You know, people in this part of the world are looking for more cruelty-free products. They are turning more to veganism and looking more religiously. You know, if you go to certain parts of Malaysia and Indonesia, girls that once went without their, you know, uh, headscarf now wear their headscarf. So attitudes are changing. They're becoming more modest. And these consumer needs are diversifying. And it's this idea of you know, diversity and environment um, that's leading fragrance and personal care trends right now, rather than the one size fits all, which has been you know, the previous sort of way that fragrances were launched. So what I really love about this idea of scent curation is that technology and fragrance are converging to create new solutions for consumers using scented delivery mechanisms that can be used at home or on the go to create more than just a good smell. So fragrance is evolving. So Japanese consumers are actually relatively new to the world of personal fragrances. For the longest time, strong scented fragrances were rejected in Japan. Um, there was a load of reasons for this, but it was always about, you know, you shouldn't invade someone else's personal space. But times have rapidly changed, and we all know that this has been led by the home care um, category. And the Japanese, as well as consumers here in Korea and other parts of developed Asia, um, now, now actively seek natural oils that claim to provide a mental as well as physical and, you know, makes you feel good boost to life. So as wages continue to stagnate in, you know, Korea and in Japan and other developed parts of Asia, and life becomes too expensive to live in a single income, more women are joining the workforce and remaining in careers in this part of the world, which is obviously driving the color cosmetics and the skincare industry here too. But what's really interesting is that women here and in you know, Japan, in a bid to personalize their work or their commuting environments and their journeys, they're seeking elements of comfort um, that were once the preserve of the home and now they're incorporating these into their work environments or even on the go to provide um, mental you know, moments of relief. And manufacturers are responding to this insight by developing solutions that can help consumers boost their mood util utilizing aroma oils. These fragrance oils can be used in the work cubicles, at yoga studios, and even portably as women take these long commutes. So, for example, if you go to, uh, for this is for the people who are not familiar with Asian work culture, you can go to a, a, a work cubicle here and the girls will have a, a USB with a fan or they might have a mini humidifier. And that's all to kind of um, soothe their skin or, or make their kind of environment feel a bit more healthful. And actually, we're now seeing this shift into fragrance rather than just humidity. 
So just like Coca-Cola's freestyle vending machine that taps into the idea of mass custom, um, has everyone here heard of the trend of mass custom? So it's just this idea that you, know, uh, you can have a, a base of ingredients and you can customize it to your exact preference. It's almost the holy grail of where the personal care industry should go in the future. Um, it's all about bespoke and custom. But the idea that scent curation manufacturers are responding to this desire to distress naturally by creating portable devices that feature actually highly personalized blends of plant oils that can help people energize, calm, or boost their moods. A great example of that would be, um, oh, let's change the slide, Sony's Aromastic, which launched in October last year, and it really taps into this demand in a big way. So Aromastic is a portable scent diffuser with a cartridge that features five different scents within its casing. And it really taps into that Asian idea about personal space um, because the key selling point to the device is, and this is actually in Sony marketing, rather than impacting the whole area, the diffuser enhances just your personal space. Whereas obviously in the West, the idea that you'd spray on a fragrance and then affect everyone around you, it's the complete opposite. So the business development team behind the Aromastic launch adds that, quote, the world of aroma holds a lot of potential. So I think from an innovation perspective, what's interesting is that now the manufacturers on the electronic side are now realizing there are huge opportunities in fragrance that can be tapped into. And it calls Aromastic a new realm of olfactory satisfaction. What's also key about this launch is that they've actually teamed up with Neil's Yard, the well-known British um, aroma oil company. So they're bringing that idea of expertise into it. Um, and, uh, and Sony states that olfactory is an area that Sony can approach in confidence. Sony made music portable, now we want to make aroma portable. Activation campaigns for this product um, have, have uh, included collaborative workshops with well-known yoga studios to introduce this product into the growing athleisure. So athleisure is that idea that you can wear kind of, you know, sports gear all day, look like you've got time to go to yoga, it's that whole look. And um, as well as into millennial women's homes, and because they're looking for a smarter diffuser than, you know, just a, a, a bottle with a couple of reed sticks sticking out of it. So as consumers seek to personalize their environments with scent rather than wearing perfume just on their bodies, it creates these new opportunities. And it actually allows the developers to shift from just scents into curation as well. And, uh, and, and it also allows us to think about more you know, innovative ways of diffusing this fragrance. So there's an, actually another Japanese brand that's also on the forefront. And um, it's on the forefront of this scent curation trend. And it's called the Aroma Oil Blender. Um, it's in Hikari department store in Shibuya. And I send a lot of my clients there on safaris to have a look at this blender. But they've actually, what they've done, so it's, uh, there's a department store where they now realize that no one makes money in department stores anymore. But let's create more of an engagement space for our consumers to try and play with the brands and inevitably before they go off and shop with them online. But they have this kind of vending machine where you can, um, you know, create the fragrance of your choice and you can pick between five different scents and you can dial it up or dial it down depending on your needs. And, um, and basically, what they're trying to do is now bring this into a wider setting. You can imagine these machines being in a range of department stores, in office blocks, in airports. They could be anywhere. Um, and basically, what you do is you dial in your preferences. I'm feeling tired today. I want extra grapefruit to energize me. And then you get a QR code, which will come to your phone, and then you can order this specific customized blend. And it's a bit like that Coca-Cola freestyle machine. You know, you have this idea of mass custom and being able to deliver your own blends as you need them and when you want them. So what? 
So with the growth of the Internet of Things, the, abil the ability to sync curate via devices controlled by apps actually opens up a whole new range of possibilities. I mean, if we think about more developed markets where the Internet of Things has taken off, for example, in the US where everyone you know, has Alexa or Nest in their homes, you'll be able to actually put fragrance in these, dial it up, what fragrance, you know, if I'm feeling tired when I step into my home, I want something energizing. I'm feeling exhausted after a long day, dial it into your phone, your Alexa will be able to um, diffuse something more relaxing. So that's really, I believe, the future of fragrance. And it's not just about being in your home, but it's also about being in your office and it's also about being in your bags too. And, if, and for some of you who think that might be a leap, that we'll all be kind of creating our own zones of fragrance uh, a bit too far, then if you just think about the vaping market, and particularly the, U, um, the UK, everyone was smoking cigarettes and now everyone vapes. So this idea that people are willing to take these electronic portable devices with them is actually quite real. So for my final trend, I'm going to have a look at what I call modern indigenous, and this is more scent oriented. So it examines, this trend examines how Asian brands are developing formats and scents and concepts that really tap into local needs, be it religious, cultural, or even contextual in terms of rapidly changing consumer preferences. And it also takes into account the growing idea of what natural is. Um, this is a, a recent launch by John Hardy. Um, it's a brand that's it's actually a jewelry brand, brand based in Bali that was bought out, but um, you know has this idea of provenance around Bali. And um, and what they and what really they're doing is tapping into the idea that Southeast Asia means more than just the obvious sense. So you know in. Luckily, in Southeast Asia, there's a whole range of native, indigenous plants and flowers. Um, but everyone seems to always pick up on citronella or lemongrass um, and, you know, for the citrus notes, which are just too obvious. However, there is just a bit more to that part of the world than citronella. And so John Hardy has really picked up on this and, um, and tapping into the brand's provenance or its, you know, its relation to barley. It's really uh, picks up on this idea that it's created the Sedap Malam scented candle. And Sedap Malam is actually Indonesian for Turberos. And, um, and the candle's main olfactive notes um, is Turberos, but it also includes jasmine petals, frangipani, incense, and sandalwood in a freshwater accord. And once the candle has been burnt out, um, it can actually be used as a jewellery bowl, so providing a secondary function. Um, it's made from reclaimed clay, and uh, so there's an idea, there's a, an element of sustainability to this candle too. And I'm actually also seeing this with um, a Singaporean brand which uses a, a marble um, uh, a candle holder. Um, the candle, uh, you know, the holder alone, the piece of marble costs sort of a hundred bucks. But the idea is that once you've burnt the candle, you can go back and have the soy refilled and keep using it. This idea of you know shifting away from uh, the disposable culture is actually really starting to take place in Southeast Asia rather than in other markets. There's actually a Korean brand which is doing something quite interesting. Um, it's called Snows. And, um, and it takes into, the, uh, takes into account the Korean trend for convenience, which is big here, you know, the pali pali, uh, fast convenience, everything needs to be now culture. And what they're doing is uh, they've created a scent curation um, service. And what customers can do is they can order six months worth of um, scented goods. And every month, the company will send its members a different scented candle, a linen fabric mist, and a diffuser. And it really takes the pain out of choosing you know, um, these products. And what it does is it, you know, it will first ask you, as a consumer, do you prefer fruity, you know, floral, woody, citrus, fresh, or powdery? Um, it takes into account the season and uh, the factors around it. And then for basically 225 bucks for six months, it will send you three products a month. Um, Malaysia's very trendy and Instagrammable new brand um, is called Apothecary. 
Um, it's a great brand. It's received a lot of publicity recently, and um, and it's actually aimed at men. Um, all the fra all the fragrances are handcrafted, which is a big word right now in Southeast Asia. Everyone's talking about handcrafted um, skincare, cosmetics, um, and fragrances. And this one, it's the brand is called the Apothecary. Um, Basically, uh, it's made out of uh, Kuala Lumpur, KL, and they all feature um, locally sourced beans, herbs, spices, and plant extracts. For example, it's Admiral Scent, which I think is shown here, um, features green mandarin, ginger, magnolia, dill, nutmeg, pepper, green gray musk, tonka beans, and cedarwood, which sounds more like a recipe than a, a typical you know, uh, fragrance. And what, what's really unique about the brand is that they've actually tapped into local climate needs by creating a solid format. Um, the apothecary's owner, Adrian Chong, said that, you know, modern males need durable packaging. You know, they're going to put it in their pocket, they're going to sit down on it, they're going to throw it in their gym bag. And, uh, and they want a product that they can use easily on the go and top up throughout the day, whereas a you know, glass, glass packs are not very durable. And so this packaging has become a real signature part of the brand. And it's, you know, as I said, it's designed to be used on the go. And, um, and they talk about, you know, keeping the man feeling fresh whenever, wherever. And as I mentioned earlier, this solid balm works particularly well in hotter climates because the top layer of the wax acts as a protection which locks down the heavier middle and base notes of the scent. Another thing about um, a lot of the scents coming out of Southeast Asia is they are um, alcohol free. Um, because in, a lot of consumers in Asia will talk about alcohol being a skin irritant. And um, so it's, you know, its ingredients are highly natural. They're beeswax, they're shea butter, they're virgin almond oil, and they're obviously fra real fragrance oils. Something that also taps into local needs, um, if you live in Asia, obviously, monsoons and rainy seasons are a big part of life. And the word petrichor um, refers to the specific smell of um, the rain. So when it's rained, the smell after is called petrichor. And one Singaporean fragrance specialist is called Ula Lab. And it's run by a French guy who developed the signature scents found at Changi Airport and at Ion Orchard. And he's launched this whole workshop that allows customers to custom blend their own scents. And he kind of uses this, uh, this chart here and you can, you know, pick the olfactory notes which really appeal to you. I think what's really interesting though is that despite all the idea of being able to custom blend, he says that the most popular scent is actually this petrichor, that people have really loved the smell of fresh rain. And it's actually based on um, green and wood notes and it's become a real local favorite. And finally, I show um, uh, some examples here from Inner's Free from Korea. And I think what's really interesting about this brand is that they've taken the inclusion of green tea to a new level. Um, and its fragrance is called Green Tea Collection. And its scents include jasmine in green tea, abyss tree in green tea, orange blossom in green tea, and camellia in green tea. And what it's done is it's shifted the category from a marketing perspective into more natural territory. By stating that the scents are in a green tea rather than having a green tea note, Innisfree has created the illusion that the fragrances are high quality tea based scents, which is really tapping into that idea that consumers are looking for natural and something that they can relate to as well, which is green tea. So to summarize, and I know I've been quicker than I should be, but I've covered a lot here. To summarize, fragrance trends are um, are highly localized now. They're really localizing and um, becoming more Asia relevant. And then through devices, becoming much smarter. So the days of a glass bottle fragrance that's advertised by sex, from, in my opinion, are not so relevant anymore. The future really is portable, smart, um, Asian-based relevant scents. Thank you.